does indeed teach us the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man. And the only reason we're righteous is because we're saved, because we're born again. But because of that, we can boldly approach the throne of grace. We can just go up to Almighty God, and He'll hear our prayers, and He can do things about it. I may not can fix it, you may not can fix it, but I promise you, Jesus Christ can fix anything. He's the God of glory. Again, it's, it's good to be here. We're going to go Lord and Word prayer, uh, take up our offering, and um, then uh, we're just going to praise and worship Almighty God because He is worthy and He is holy. And I hope that's what you came here for this morning. And I promise you, if you came expecting God to talk to you, He will speak to you. It's just like when you go fishing and when you go hunting, gentlemen, you go expecting to catch something or kill something. Ladies, when you go out shopping, you expect to find a sale. When you, when you come to church, you should come to church expecting God to talk to you in some way. But it is good to see each and everyone. Let's go to the Lord in word of prayer this morning. Dear Lord and Master, I just want to thank you and I want to praise you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I want to thank you for our salvation, for the finished work of Calvary, for all the wonderful things that you've blessed us with, Lord. We live in the greatest country on earth, and we just, by your grace, pray that you would bless this nation. Be with our leaders, each one that puts on uniform in the United States. Lord, there seems to be so much uncertainty and so many issues in this great nation that you've blessed us with. But, Lord, you're greater than any of them, and we just lay them in your hands and just ask that you would touch our hearts and teach us how to love you more every day. Teach us how to praise you and honor you more. Place a burden upon our hearts for prayer and and, and, and praise and Lord just place a burden upon our hearts to see the lost saved and to be that witness and to live a life in such a way that Lord they can see your light through our lives we're nothing but you're everything we praise you and we honor you for that and this morning Lord we pray that you just bless the song service Lord the praise and worship let it be through you by you and for you your word teaches us that you inhabit the praises of your people and we believe with all of our hearts because you said so that you'll be in here in our midst when we praise you with a perfect heart, made perfect by your blood and what you've done at Calvary. Dear Lord, your word teaches us that you're in our midst where two or three are gathered together. And Lord, we just want to ask that you would just have your way here this morning, that you would set aside the cares and concerns of the outside world. And dear Master, you would just meet with these people, that you would meet with us. And dear Lord, speak to us and be honored and glorified and just lifted up in each and everything that's said in each and everything that's done. And we pray humbly these things in Jesus' holy and sweet name. Amen.
You're the name of 
God is good this morning. I want to tell you just to, to, to worship Him and, and praise and, and do want to thank our musicians, singers, and each one for just lifting up their hearts and praise to the one that's worthy, to the one that's holy, to the one that saved us, to the one that makes a way where there is no way, the one that breaks chains that mankind cannot break, the one that lays a foundation that nothing can shake. Praise God for the music selection this morning. And for each one that goes to make part of it. And just want to, again, want to just thank God and, and, and the church here for the opportunity to be with you this morning. And, and just praise the Lord for uh, Brother Brian and just keep him much in your prayers as your dear pastor. Just, uh, just have the utmost respect and love for him. And look forward to spending the rest of eternity with him forever in heaven, praising God. And you also, by the grace of his mercy and his glory. Turn, if you would, this morning, in God's Word. We're going to look just a couple of verses in Matthew. Then we're going to get into Acts, I believe, the 16th chapter. And we're going to be singing about the, or, or what we sung about a while ago. The, and God knows what's going on. He always prepares our hearts. And, and I believe with all my heart that if you will listen, God has something for me and has something for you this morning. And we're going to talk about that light, like he was speaking of in the darkness, at that midnight hour that, that he was speaking of in that first song and the second song about the, the chains being broken and, and the captives set free and, and the shaking of the prison. We're going to look at that in, in the 16th chapter of Acts. And we're going to you know, even, even look further. At, at that praise and that prayer and, and it's just awesome what God can do of our lives if we'll just spend our time in prayer and praise to honor Him, to glorify Him, to trust Him but this morning there, there, there's, there's just a deep need I think for us to realize reality church, this world is not our home it's not our home is in heaven in the presence of God our home is in glory with Jesus Christ and those that went on before us. Our home is in a place that has streets paved with gold. Our home is a place that has no sorrow, has no suffering, has no cancer, has no COVID, has no, no, no strife, no anger, no, no frustration. It has nothing bad, nothing sin, nothing wrong about it. It is in glory in heaven with Jesus Christ himself. That is our home. And as children of God, we need to lift up our heads. We need to start living like our destination is heaven. Quit trying to set up camp here in, in the wilderness and as, as the children of Israel so often did for 40 years, we need to realize we're just passing through. And our task is not to build monuments here. Our task is not to accomplish great things in and of the world. Our task is to take just as many people as we can with us to glory. Our task is to see souls saved. Our task is to honor God. Because Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. So praise God, if we in service, if we in our lives, if we in our families will lift up the name of Jesus Christ, I believe God will draw people to him because God said so. It ain't based on my opinion. It's based on what God said. So just lift up Jesus Christ in your homes, in your life, in your in your thoughts and here in worship together with him and just praise God I believe that souls will be saved hearts will be changed and needs will be met chains will be broken and light will shine out in the darkness. We're going to read just a couple of verses in Matthew, as we said. And beginning in um, uh, uh, chapter 5, uh, let's see, I don't, don't forget about what I, okay. Beginning in verse 10 through 12, it says, Blessed are they which are persecuted. And this is Jesus Christ, and the greatest preacher and the greatest message. In the middle of the message, he says, Blessed, happy, blessed of God, are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you and falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Let us pray. Lord and Master, I thank you and I praise you for every gift, for every blessing, for your Son, Jesus Christ, and our salvation. Lord, I thank you for these people. 
And I just pray that you'd bless each and every one that's assembled here. I pray that you'd bless Brian, their dear pastor, and just guard and keep each one. Put a hedge around their children, their grandchildren. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would live so strongly through. Lord, those that go to make up this local assembly, that for generations that souls would be saved and hearts touched, that they could, Lord, just... Just, just revel in the joy and the love which your spirit shines in their hearts and their lives. And Lord, we pray for this nation. Lord, we pray that you would bless its leaders, its troops. Lord, we pray that you would bless each one that, that, that just has a part and lives in this great nation. I pray you would bless your people Israel. Your word teaches us that, 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 Lord, if we will bless your people and lift them up in prayer and just pray for them, that you'll bless the nation that blesses your people Israel. And I pray that this would always be a nation which blesses your people Israel. Lord, I just pray this morning in your precious name that you'd speak to us through your word. And I thank you so, Lord, greatly and, and worship you and glorify you. Just your spirit and your presence doesn't happen but praises your people. And I thank you for the message and song and, and spirit and praise and worship this morning. Lord, and I just want to thank you and I want to praise you because you are worthy and holy. And I pray, Lord, that you'd speak to us through your word this morning. Lord, I pray you'd cleanse me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. And Lord, that, that I would be nothing but something that you would use this morning. I pray that your word would go forth, that it would accomplish that which you said it to, that it would not return void. That Lord, we would never be the same after having been in your presence, but let the messenger be forgotten. Lord, we love you, and we pray that souls would be saved, your son lifted up, and we would love you more today than we've ever loved you before, casting all of our cares upon you. We love you, and we praise you, and we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Excuse me. Jesus said, blessed, happy are you. Now, I've never reached that point where I'm happy about being persecuted, talked about, or gossiped about. But as a child of God, we need to realize that the servant is not better than the master. And if they mocked and made fun and... Certainly, if you look at popular culture in America today, it seems like they want to look down upon Christians and want to talk about us as being backward or, or whatever it may be. But I want to tell you something. We are those that have been blessed by God. We are those that are God's called out. We are those that have been saved and sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. And God's here. Jesus Christ said, Blessed, happy will you be when they revile you, when they persecute you. What they do to our master? What they do to the disciples? What they do to all before that have honorably and, and righteously and faithfully serve God. The world persecuted them. The world martyred them. The world spurned them. The world mocked them. The world talked about them. The world, and he said, great shall be your reward. But he didn't say on earth. He said in heaven. This is not our home. Praise God, it's good when God blesses us. We live in the greatest countries, got the greatest prosperity. We have blessings all around us. We, we have just wonderful people and wonderful things that happen to go around us. But we need to realize that this world is not the place that we're going to reside. That this world, it, yes, there's good things that God wants to bless his children with, wants to bless his people with. But this world is not our home and how we deal with those those midnight times how we deal with those times when we're persecuted how we deal with those times when they may be talking about you they may uh, mock you and make fun of you because of your faith you may not get that promotion because of your faith you may not uh, be fitting in with that group because of your faith or your stand for Jesus Christ I want you to tell you to stand fast stand firm let the light of Christ shine inside of you we want to look with God's help this morning at a couple of men that were willing to be sold out to God and how God God, in, in what was a desperate and a horrible time, in a prison, with chains upon them, his light shone up in the middle of the night and blessed and saved and moved, and a mighty work was done even in the worst of possible times. In Acts, we're going to begin in the 16th chapter, beginning in about verse uh, uh, 14. And we went and kind of set the stage. This is in Philippi, and, and Paul and Silas is preaching, and, and they're teaching, and, and God's doing work. I mean, they're having revival. They're seeing a good time. They're doing exactly what God wanted them to do and exactly the place God wanted them to be, preaching the gospel that God wanted them to preach. And souls were being saved, and hearts were being touched, and needs were being met, and miracles were being done. God was being glorified, and Jesus was being lifted up. It was a wonderful time as far as I could tell. And we want to look at a little bit of that with God's help. And he says, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, so she was rich of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God and heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and, and abide there. And she constrained us. 
God will give you mountaintop experiences. There are times that everything is going right. There's times when all your bills are paid, when the family seems to be going good, when your heart is at peace, when your walk with God is good. But, but there's an old saying that I've found to be true in my 57 years of life. You're either coming out of a storm, you're in a storm, or you're going into a storm. Life seems to be a series of ups and downs like a roller coaster, or a series of valleys and mountains, a series of times when we face challenges and the times when we have peace. And here was a time when, when, when they were, I mean, they were had to have been just overjoyed and thrilled with what God was doing. They, they were probably at the best place they'd been at in a long time. They, they were seeing people save Lydia, someone who was quite well off, we can tell from the text had been saved and her whole household had been saved and they'd been baptized and, and, and she was providing for them. They were well fed. They were well clothed. They were well housed. They were, they were seeing God move. They were seeing souls saved. They were seeing the name of Jesus lifted up. All was going wonderful. I'm sure they were laughing and just full of joy and happiness. They were having revival. Praise God. They were having a good time. But look at what Satan sends their way. He says... In verse 16, it came to pass as they, we went to prayer, a certain damsel, they were doing what God wanted to do, a certain damsel, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. And the same followed Paul and us, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which shew us the way of salvation. And she did this many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Now, I kind of get an idea of what's going on. Paul and them are having revival, and they're preaching in this town, and, and they're seeing souls saved. And Satan sends someone, a, a damsel, a young lady who's possessed of a devil, a demon, and she's following them around, and she's yelling. What she's saying is the truth, but she's disturbing the preaching of the gospel. She's disturbing the move of the Spirit. She's quenching the move that God's been doing. What's going on is of the devil, and it's being done to trip up. Anytime you decide to serve God, Anytime you decide to read God's word more, anytime you decide to be more faithful in service and church to God, anytime you decide to start having family devotion and start living for God and witnessing and, and whatever it may be that God's laid upon your heart that will draw you closer to him and, and have, let you have a deeper walk with it. Whenever you start to do something like that, you better watch out. Satan's going to be after you. The old devil don't like what you're doing when you're loving God. Now, if, uh, the old boy out there that's uh, living his life for the devil and, and, and don't know God, don't know nothing about God, Satan's not going to mess with him much because he's already got him. But you that are God's chosen, you that are God's soldiers, you that are saved, you that have the Holy Spirit of God live within you, Satan hates you. And he wants to trip you up. He wants to bring things into your life. And here, he's bringing something that, that, that Paul and Silas address and and, and it says, just a little further, And when her master saw that the hope of their gains were gone, they called Paul and Silas and drew them out of the marketplace and to the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us and receive neither to observe being Romans. Now, the world was upset about what was going on because it was costing them money. You see... Money, Jesus said, and that sermon was talking about earlier, you cannot love to, to, cannot serve two masters. You will love the one, hate the other, despise one, and cling to the other. And you cannot serve God and mammon or the things of this world. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not it. It's not that there's not lovely things in the world, but when, when, when our heart's desires the things of this world, when our, when our dreams are upon the things of this world, when our goals are found, when our foundation is of this world, it will crumble and fall. But when our foundation is the love of God, when our foundation is, 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 is our hope in heaven, the truth that God loves us, the truth that we are children saved and sealed by the Holy Spirit of God, of Almighty God, when that is the firm foundation and the truth of this life, the storms of life will assail you and come against you, but you will not fall. But the world's not going to like you. Here Paul and Silas, have, they, 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 they've stood and they've done the right thing and they've been drugged down. And let's see. They, now, you just get to really wrap your mind around what's going on. They're doing what God wants them to do in the place God wants them to be, honoring God in exactly the way God wants to be honored, doing the right thing, and their world's fixed to be turned upside down. You ever feel that way, church? You're doing your very best to live for Jesus Christ, for God. You're doing your very best to 
to, to think the right thoughts, to praise the right praise, to, to read the word, to, 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 to share the gospel. And it even seems that then the world just wants to turn apart. It, it doesn't seem strange that the world doesn't like a group of people that believe in truth, that believe in honoring God, that believe in, 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 in loving and protecting their neighbors and being there when things go high. And it seems like the world absolutely hates the devout child of God. But, but here he says here that, um, and the multitudes rose up together against them, and the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Many are called, but few are chosen, the word of God says. Doing exactly what they were supposed to be doing. They were taken and they were beaten. Remember, you are a child of God. This world doesn't like you. This world doesn't like what you stand for. This world doesn't like what you represent. This world does not like who inhabits you and, and controls you and, and leads you and loves you. This world does not like it. And don't be surprised. Don't be shocked at, at, at the things the world might bring you. But praise God. God can do a work through all this. And it goes on, he says in verse 22, I mean 23, and he says, When they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, having received such a charge thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. I want to give you a picture of what's going on here. Again, I'm going to say it. They were doing what God wanted, when God wanted, how God wanted, for the right reason, the right heart. Uh, they, they were on fire for God. They were in revival. Things were going good. They're doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. And they get attacked by the world. And the world drags them down. And the world arrests them. And, and I want you just to just imagine these two men of God. It says they took him and they beat him. And that day it meant they took sticks and they, they turned their backs into hamburger meat. They spat upon them. They mocked them. They, they tore the flesh up on their backs. And it says they, that they took a, and went to a jailer and he commanded them to be put into the inner prison and put in stocks. Okay, Paul and they're, they're in this. They, their backs are like hamburger meat. They've been doing exactly what God wants them to do. And it says he put them to the inner prison. Now, the inner prison was a little room with only one door, no lights, no windows, no nothing. There would probably have been 30 or 40 men and various people in there on various different things. And there was no restrooms. There would have been filth and excrement, human waste in the floor a couple of inches deep. It said he put them in stocks. And, in, and stocks in that day, they would, uh, let me just kind of illustrate, they would, Take a stock was a long log, and they would lay that log across several men that were sitting in the floor, and they would lay, and then they would chain their hands, their feet over that log in their belly, and that's how they left them, in the dark, sitting in human excrement, their backs bleeding, broken and hurting, couldn't even move. I don't know about you, but I've been feeling real sorry for myself right about then. I would have been asking God. Why am I going through this? I'm trying to do the right thing, Lord. I'm standing for your name. I'm preaching your word. Why am I going through? That's what I would have been doing, brother. But you see, these men of God knew the God they served was greater than the problem that they were facing. These men of God knew that the way that you got out of that prison, that the change would be broken, was not by them being tough, but by turning to the one who could answer their prayers. So let's see what they do. They're in these stocks. They're, they're in this inner room. They're surrounded by chained up men who are also in stocks and hanging on walls. And, and there's moaning and crying and begging and people just wanting it to be done and over with. And they're, they're fastened here and, they're, 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 and they can barely breathe. And let's see what they've done. And at midnight, at the darkest time, when they did, there's no light whatsoever in this inner room. You all ever been in a cave and they cut the lights out? And, and my son and I were at Cathedral Caverns a few a month and a half, a couple months ago, and, and, and they cut the lights off when you got to the very, about a mile and a half back in that mountain, and you can't even see your hand in front of your face. There's no light. There was no light in that little inner prison. It says at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. They sang praises. I'm going to say it. There is power in prayer and praise. I'm going to say it again just to emphasize it. There is power in prayer and praise. And when it's midnight and you're in the stocks and the world's turned crazy upon you and the world has turned upon you and all seems black and all seems hopeless, your heart's full of despair and your life's just black and wreck around you, there is power in prayer and praise. 
There's a lot of us old boys, and if I was to ask a question, on a rifle, shotgun, pistol or two. We live in a nation that's got the greatest military that has ever walked the face of the earth. We have planes and tanks, the best trained soldiers, the finest young men and women serving, trained, led, inspired, dedicated. We have weapons that can destroy a city in the blink of an eye. We have machines going under the ocean that's got, they can't be spotted. We got all this, and I want to tell you, the true power of this nation doesn't lie in that. The true power of this nation does not lie in our government. The true power in this nation relies on prayer and praise. If this nation, the United States of America, will lift up its eyes and pray to God and humble itself and seek His face and then praise the holy name of Jesus, there ain't nothing will ever stand against this nation. But if we turn our backs upon God, if we take and we silence our hearts and our minds and our families and our churches and our schools and, our, and, and everything, if we silence the prayer and we quit praising God, you can look for this nation to fall in spite of our power, in spite of our wealth, in spite of everything else that goes. Paul and Silas found the truth led by the Holy Spirit of God that there was power in prayer and praise. Unto God, it says, and the prisoners heard them. You want to see your loved ones saved? You want to see your neighbors saved? You want to see your community turned on its ear? You want to see this nation turn around? If the church will do those two things, prayer and praise. There's power in it, if I didn't mention that. It really is. We can see, he said, the others heard them. The other prisoners that were there, they heard them. There are so many in this world that are prisoners of their own device, of sin. There's so many in this world that are prisoners of Satan. They're, they're prisoners of the bottle. They're prisoners of the drug. They're prisoners of their money. They're prisoners of pride. They're prisoners of despair and depression of the world and all the things that the world offers and are, that are lies and fakes that don't satisfy, don't last, don't really do anything but lead you down a path of destruction. There's prisoners everywhere. But if we, the church, will pray and praise God, there's power in it. And the lost will see that and they'll look upon us. Because I want to tell you, if they picked up that Bible there and they read it, they couldn't understand it because my word of God tells me that it's spiritually discerned. The only Bible the lost world will ever see and read is your life and the love of God living in your life. That is the Bible the world sees. That is the Bible the world hears. That is the Bible. And, and you, as that light upon the hill, letting God's love and, the, and the, the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ shine through your life in the darkest of nights, is the true gospel that the world will see and hear. Of heaven, sweet, hell, hot, and Jesus Christ, the only way. If you've ever noticed... It's at midnight. It's in the darkest of times that the smallest little light shines the brightest. You ever notice that? And I want to tell you, you can look around at this nation at the murder and the lying, the, the, the fear, the despair that's going on around in, this, in the world today. We as God's people need to let our little light shine in the darkest of night and the world will see it and they'll come to that light. There's power in prayer and praise. There's power. Let's see what kind of power Paul and Silas found in that jail cell. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Praise God that, that I believe is the third song they were singing. Praise God for today. They were singing about those foundations. What's the foundation of your life? Because I want to tell you, if it's based on money, if it's based upon your physical ability, if it's based upon uh, position and power or luck or whatever it may be in this world, it will shake when the storms come. But if your foundation is founded in the rock that is Jesus Christ, if the foundation of your family is founded in the love of Almighty God and the Word of God and the promises of God and what God has said and what God has done and what God's going to do, that foundation will not shake, cannot be taken down, 
cannot be moved in any way whatsoever because it is based upon the God of glory that can cover all of creation with His thumb, that can answer any prayer, move any mountain, meet any need, do any miracle. He is Almighty God and there is none beside Him and Jesus Christ is His name. Glory to God. Paul and Silas, they, they, in the midst of in them stocks, in the midst of them chains on, in the midst of in the, in the worst, but I cannot imagine how awful it must have been to one minute be in revival and the next day, but by, because they were doing what God wanted them to do, they're, 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 their backs are hamburger meat, their, hand, their hands are in chain, they're bent over the slog, they're, they're sitting in several inches of human waste, and, and they start singing praises to God and praying. And suddenly a great earthquake comes and it shakes the foundations. And immediately, and the doors were open and everyone's bands were loose. Chains were broken. Praise God for the one that can break chains. We live in a society that there's so many whose lives are in chains. Chains of addiction, chains of despair, chains of loneliness, chains of pain, chains of disappointment, chains of hurt. If we will take our eyes off of this world and place our eyes upon Jesus, God never said for us to look down at this world. The Lord never said for us to focus our eyes upon the things of this world. He never said this world was our home. He said, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Think about Peter when he's out in that boat. And, and he had constrained them. He had, he had made them go out across that that water, they were having revival. They were talking about making Jesus a king. He just fed 5,000 with a little child's lunch. And, and he said he constrained them to get into a boat. He made them. Jesus Christ made them get in this boat and sent them into a storm. And he came walking in the midst of the storm. I believe that we need to realize sometimes God lets his children go through storms. He constrains us. To go. I've been through a few myself that I really didn't understand then. And I probably won't understand what Jesus tells me about it in glory. I believe that he will constrain us. He will send us into storms just so he can come to us walking on water. And then it's up to us whether we want to get out of the boat. Everybody always talks about Peter taking his eyes off of Jesus and sinking a little bit. But he was the only one that had a back, enough backbone to get out of the boat. The rest of them sit there saying, well, I ain't going to do that. You want to walk on water? you got to trust God. What is trusting God? Trusting God is simply believing that God cannot lie. What he's written in his word and what he said he can do, he will do, has done, will always do. Just believe in God. Disciples here, Paul, Silas, they're, they're, they're in this, this prison. It says the, the, the bands were loose, the chains were gone. Every, not only theirs, but the other ones there. And the keeper of the prison, waking out of his sleep. This man was asleep. Now, I want you to get a real idea about what's going on. This man, now, he probably wasn't the one that beat them, but he was the one that, that had probably executed people before. He had probably executed innocent people. He, would, he put them in the inner prison. He had, he had locked them over these logs. He didn't care what they were in. He didn't care about their backs. He, I'm sure they didn't get fed. I'm sure they didn't get no water. I'm sure he could care less if they died. As long as they didn't get away, he'd be okay and he'd get his paycheck and wouldn't get executed for what losing prisoners, which was what the Romans done. It says, the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, seeing that the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself. Let me tell you something. The world depends upon the world's way, and you depend upon the things of the world. There will come a point when it won't carry you up, and you're just going to want to die. God won't let you down, but this world will let you down. God will never fail you. He will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. But this world will, like some drunk redneck, drag you behind the things that like a drunk redneck dragging you behind a truck drag you down the ways of this world and leave you bleeding, bruised, and busted up in the ditch. This world don't care. God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you on the cross. He says he would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners had fled. And Paul, with a loud voice, I, after what had been done to me, if I had been Paul, I probably just would have kept my mouth shut. I would have. This guy didn't deserve to live. He didn't deserve mercy. He had, he had killed innocent men, I'm sure. He had, he had put them in these stocks. He did not care if his prisoners lived or died. He just wanted them kept in there so his life would be okay. This was a, a cruel man who was chosen for this job because he did not have an ounce of pity within him. And Paul cries with a loud voice, Do thyself no harm! 
Man is not capable of that kind of love that Paul had. That's the Holy Spirit of God working through a man. I can promise you there's been people do things to you in your life. They don't deserve your forgiveness or your mercy, but God says you've got to show it and you've got to give it. And if you're like me, you can't do it. God's, got, God's Holy Spirit living through you has to do it. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Quit letting yourself be the Lord of your life. Let go and let God be God. Quit trying to run your own future. Just let go and let God be God. Let him be who he is and who he is. It's God Almighty. Who he is is the one that loves you so much that he left the portals of glory. Do you, I mean, I think we all realize this, but I think we need to remind on occasion that Jesus Christ had never left glory and never suffered the cross and never took the stripes and never took the beating and never took the nails and never was shamed and, and humiliated before all mankind there at that time in Jerusalem at Calvary. If he had never done that, he still would have been God. He still would have been worshipped by a host of angels. He still would have been the glorious king of all there is. It wasn't three rusty nails. It wasn't the Roman centurions or legions. It wasn't all the demons of hell that held him on that cross. It was his love for you. It was all that held Jesus Christ on that cross. Because if he hadn't died on that cross and rose from the dead, we would have all busted hell wide open. And I would have deserved it. I ain't going to speak for nobody else, but I would. But I love my Lord because he done that for me. He's worthy of every breath. I wish I could quote the words of that song we sung a while ago. There's not enough breath in this body to praise him like he deserves. There's not enough years in, in eternity to honor him the way he deserves to be honored. There's not enough glory that we can lay upon him that will match the glory that his holiness demands. He is worthy. He's God. Here Paul and Silas had called out, or Paul had called out the prisoner, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Even the prisoners that were with Paul and Silas realized God's done a thing. When God starts doing a thing, those around you will realize it. So just let God do a thing. And the most important question that's ever been asked by anyone, and I hope that each one of you have asked this question and God has answered this question for you and you've given your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. But listen to this question because the world needs to ask this question. It'll fix poverty. It'll fix hunger. It'll fix the hatred. It'll fix the problems that this nation faces if the world will ask this one question. Then he called for a lot. The world needs a light, and you are that light. And came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? It says him and his whole home, his household, got saved that day. Sir, what must I do to be saved? He didn't ask how can I get a hold of this power? He didn't say, how did this happen? He didn't say, how I can be a better person or have a heart like you, Paul? He didn't say, how I can clean up my life or, or, or treat my wife and kids better or nothing like that. He said, what must I do to be saved? You know, there are a lot of different groups and cliques and religion. And y'all have heard me say this before. I hate religion. I hate it with a passion. I really do. Religion is man's rules trying to get to God. Relationship is God reaching down to man through, through love, through Jesus Christ. You see, the, the, the answer to that question, if you ask different groups, they'll, they'll say do this or do that or jump through these religious hoops or turn this around or get yourself better or wash up and clean up. Do all. Uh -uh. The God's Holy Spirit in Romans 10 and 9 answers that question very clearly and very simply. Jesus said it so simply and the small child can understand it. Confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. And believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. He said, thou shalt be saved. He didn't say might. He didn't say maybe. He didn't say if you keep the rest of these rules and do the rest of these things and, and start dressing a certain way. He said, thou shalt be saved. Confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. What that means, real simple, is to let Jesus Christ be who he is, the Lord of your life. To declare him to the world, the Lord of your life, the master, the curios. That's the Greek word. And believe in that heart that God hath raised him from the dead. That's easy. 
I know that I know that I know that he's alive because he dwells in my heart because I've seen what he's done. And and, in Ephesians 2 and 8, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If any man lack faith, just ask God. God, I mean, just believe and confess. Not religion. It's relationship. You know, when I was 11 years old, Everybody out there at Mount Hebron was going down. My age group, my the guys. And they were shaking hands with the priest and getting baptized. That's what you've done. You've not done that. And I've never done nothing all that much wrong. I was in church three. I was joking this morning in the sound booth that the only drug problem I ever have is mom drove me to church on Sunday morning. She drove me to church on Sunday night. She drove me to church on Wednesday night. She drove me to choir practice on Monday. She drove me to church every time the doors open. Mama drove me to church. Well, I love, praise God for my mom. But you know what? I was lost as a rock. God never had dealt with my heart. I hadn't made the Lord of my life. I'd just gotten something like everybody else. I went got baptized, said some words, whatever. When I was 15, Jerome Shore was preaching revival. Out at Waco Baptist Church. And after I got out of that, and he preached hell hot that night. And I got on that church bus, and God knocked on my heart, so I said, John, you're not saved. And that night on the church bus in the parking lot at Waco Baptist Church, I gave my heart and my life to Jesus Christ. And I said that to say this. Don't count on some religious experience walking down an aisle saying some words. You need This is the most important question that you will ever ask. I'm not trying to make you doubt your salvation because if you've been saved, you're saved, you're sealed, it's forever. But you need to know that you know that you know that you've been born again. There is heaven to gain and hell to miss. Heaven is real and wonderful and glorious and full of joy, happiness, peace. And hell is a place that was made for Satan and his angels. Hell was not made for any person. But the free choice that we have in this life is to choose one path or the other. And I want to ask you this morning, would you choose Jesus? Just look down inside of yourself, and you know if you're saved. You know it. You ain't got to put on no show or nothing else. You can do right there. Just ask God to come into your heart. You, you can do it beside your bed. You ain't got to be. You ain't even got to be in a certain kind of building or anything else. You just ask Jesus Christ to, to be the Lord of your life, and then tell somebody. And He said, "I'll save you. You shall be saved." He said, "So simply, even a child can understand." Don't take no big religious sum. Just trust and believe. Ask Him to save you this morning if you don't know Him. As they come with a song of invitation, whatever it may be that God's dealt with you this morning, I would encourage you. If you need power, power is available. The same God that lived in Paul lives in you as a child of God. Prayer and praise, that's where the power is at. And if you're like this jailer and you need Jesus Christ, and God's answered that question in your heart this morning, be saved. There is nothing in this world worth going to hell for. There ain't. And there's so much in heaven worth going to heaven for, and the greatest thing is Jesus Christ. Come on, stand your feet. As they come with a song.